Good morning. The Freeport Mennonite Church hosts uh, the Mennonite Central Committee uh, meat canning project every year. This food gets sent all over the world. 10% of all cans that are, that are put together stay in the local area to the food pantries. Uh, some have come here, some have gone to Freeport food pantries, but it's a great work. And if you can free up four hours of your time, any time during Monday through Thursday of next week, uh, they would love you to uh, be part of their meat canning adventure. My wife has been there many times. She doesn't mind getting her hands dirty with food. Um, her husband, on the other hand, give me a broom, I'll sweep up, but yeah. I do the kitchen cleaning after Thanksgiving. I don't want to be sticking things inside that turkey, though. Maybe it's just me. If you get a moment, please fill out the Friendship Register that's on the row of every, uh, on the end of every row. Fill out a record of your attendance. If there's a prayer request on your heart, please jot, jot that down so that we can have the whole church praying for you. I'm sure there's a lot of people you know who uh, may be part of your family who are far from the Lord, and you'd like to see them come to faith in Christ during this Christmas season. Write them down. Let us know who to pray for. Then pass it to the person next to you. Uh, Jeremy's already stated that it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I mean, the Bears and Packers are out of it already, so you know it's almost Christmas. <laughs> the weather feels like Christmas. Uh, 10 degrees, 15 degrees outside. Cheryl and I got back from Florida where it was in the 70s and low 80s, and we get here and you got to wear a heavy coat. Anyway, Christmas. We're starting a Christmas series called The Christmas Story. We have these little pamphlets on the counters on your way out. We'd like every family, one per family, to take one, go through this Advent season by... Well, now you'll know what I'll be speaking on every Sunday. Today is the Advent of Hope. It's the first one. Actually, Advent of Hope started last Sunday, but we're a week behind because we kept on in the Jedediah series one extra week. So Advent of Hope is what we'll cover today, and then next week we'll cover the Advent of Peace. And you're saying, what is Advent? Well, that's why you get this, because page 12 tells you. It says this. Advent is a season of four Sundays that mark the beginning of a new church year. The ancient Christian church celebrated Advent as a kind of fresh start to faith and worship. Advent is a time to anticipate and spiritually prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior, God's gift of love to us. At the same time, Advent anticipates and hopes for Jesus' glorious return at the end of the age. The word Advent comes from the Latin. Anybody know? Okay, Adventio. That wasn't hard. Just add an I-O at the end of it. Adventio, meaning coming or arrival. Advent means coming or arrival. The traditional Bible readings for Advent teach how the prophets, kings, and forerunners prepared the way for the coming Messiah. So we invite you to get one of these if we run out. Mark it on the French register, I didn't get one. And, well, Joyce, we can mail them. I mean, we can get them rushed here for next Sunday. So get that, please. Today we'll be looking at the Christmas story, the advent of hope. What do you hope for this Christmas? Well, for many, especially children, they hope that their Christmas stockings are filled with goodies, that there's lots of Christmas presents under the tree, Many hope for a happy family gathering, safety for those who travel to us, a good family dinner, peace among family members. Are we, are we praying for that already? Peace among family. Many hope this Christmas season that there'd be peace in the world. When you think of war that's happening in the Ukraine and in Russia, hostilities, suffering because of war. Peace, praying for peace. Anybody here hope for peace in our country? What a divided country we live in. Peace among our races, peace among Democrats and Republicans. And the list could go on. 
But now we're going to look at the Advent season, the Advent of hope. The Old Testament has prophesied often the hope of a future Messiah. Every time you look at the word Christ, when we sing Christ in our songs, it really is the Greek word for Messiah, which is a Hebrew word. Christ, the hope of the Christ, the Messiah. And Isaiah 9 is one of those places where it speaks of the prophecy of hope. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 9. If you don't have one, there's one in the seat in front of you. Turn to the left, that's the Old Testament. And turn to page 492. My theme for this morning is hope has come, for God at the right time sent his son. Hope has come, for God at the right time sent his son. Over 2,400 years ago, the last prophet of the Old Testament is a man by the name of Malachi. And Malachi spoke for God. That's what a prophet does. A prophet speaks for God. That was 2,400 years ago. And then following Malachi, there was 400 years where there was no prophetic word. There was no voice of God among the people. They call that the 400 silent years or the silent years. And we get to the New Testament and God is ready to do a new work, a new thing. It tells us in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. Born of a woman, born under the law. At the right, appropriate time in the history of the world, God intervenes by sending his son into the world. God sent his son to bring sinful people hope. As I said, the Old Testament has many prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah. I want to read... Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Isaiah, when he writes his book, his scroll, chapters 7, 8, and 9 are really one unit. One unit. It focuses on the coming of the Messiah. If you go back to chapter 7... Verse 14 is well known. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. We've heard that before, right, during the Christmas season? Go to chapter 8, verse 8. Jumping right in the middle of the story here, then it will sweep on into Judah, it will overthrow and pass through, it will reach even to the neck, and spread of its wings will fill the breadth of your land. What's he talking about? It doesn't matter. I'm not going to cover that. The last two words are, O Emmanuel. O Emmanuel, God with us. Two verses later in verse 10, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. That's the word Emmanuel. Three times, Emmanuel, God with us. And then you get to chapter 9, and the people who walk in darkness, they'll see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And you go down to verse 6, and it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And you're reading this, and you're focusing on Christmas, right? Advent. You know the difficulty with uh, Old Testament prophecy? 
you never know right off the bat is the prophet talking about a specific situation of his time? Or does the prophet look ahead and speak of Jesus Christ's first coming? Or is the prophet looking further ahead to talk about the advent of him coming back? Don't don't you wish uh, it would have been really easy that the prophet would said, hey, this is for this time right here. Make no mistake. That's the difficulty with prophecy. Is he speaking about a contemporary situation or the first advent or the second advent? Well, That's why we're going to look at chapter 9 this morning. Before we get started, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you so much for the word of God. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's difficult. And we ask that you would give me wisdom, give me insight in how to share your word to make it clear to your people. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is our primary teacher. And so we ask that the Holy Spirit would work through me to teach. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The advent of hope. Well, in verse 2, I can see uh, hope was given to people who walk in darkness. It's clear. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. So the first thing in my study when I came across this verse is, well, who are those who walk in darkness? That's a good question, right? Who are the ones who walk in darkness? Well, you got to go back to the historical setting of chapter 7, verse 1. It came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, to make it clear who Ahaz is. The son of Uzziah, king of Judah. So Ahaz's father's name, Jotham, and Ahaz's grandfather's name, Uzziah. And if you go back a chapter, it was in the year of King Uzziah's death that Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. And the seraphim flying around the Lord saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. King Uzziah. Good king, until he got leprosy. Here we have this king named Ahaz. And during his reign, we have the king of Judah. He's the king of Judah, that Rezin, who's king of Syria, or Aram. And Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel. The kingdom is split, so north Israel and the kingdom of Syria are coming together to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. That's the situation. Isaiah sees this whole situation. You can read about this more in 2 Kings chapter 16. But Ahaz is not like his father, Jotham. He's not like his grandfather, Uzziah. And he's certainly not like King David. It tells us in 2 Kings 16 that he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. In fact, if you read the list of his sins, he even did child sacrifice. And Isaiah, the prophet, comes to him and is trying to get his attention to focus on the Lord. And Ahaz is not going to trust in God. So here we have the king of Israel and the king of Aram coming down to wage war. They want to overthrow him. It says in verse 6, their thinking is, let's go up against Judah. Let's terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls. And let's set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Let's set up a puppet king that will control. And Isaiah comes along in verse 7 and says, Thus says Yahweh God, the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Isaiah gives a prophecy. Their plans are not going to work. Trust God. But Ahaz doesn't trust God. He makes an appeal to Tiglath-Pileser, who's king of Assyria, which is a major power at this time. He says, Come. Come help me. 
there are these two little kingdoms attacking me, and I need your help. And so Tiglath, let's call him Tiggy, Tiggy says, well, give me some gold and silver, and I'll come. And so he gives them all gold and silver from the palace and from the, the house of the Lord. And Tiggy comes down. He attacks Syria, puts that king to death. He comes into Israel, north Israel, and takes the kingdom of, well, the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulon and around the Galilee area. He takes them into captivity. One of Pekah, who was the king at the time, one of his men, Hoshea, assassinates him and sits on the throne in his place. And Ahaz thinks, my plan worked. I asked for help, and I got help. But in Isaiah chapter 8, the king of Assyria, it says in verse well, 7, middle of the verse, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and it will rise up over the channels and over all its banks, using a, a river overflowing metaphor, and it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck and spread its wings, it will fill the breath of your land. Assyrians came into the land of Judah. In 2 Chronicles, which is a parallel passage, chapter 28, it says in verse 16, at that time, King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria for help. In verse 20, so Tiglath-Pileser, or king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. And although Ahaz took a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the palace of the king and from all the princes and gave it to the king of Assyria, it did not help him. He trusted in his own thinking to bring rescue to the land. And he got trouble instead. Okay, that's the background. Who are those who walk in darkness? Well, we're reading in chapter 9, verse 2, where we see it, so we have to go into the context to look at it. So let's go back to verse 16 of chapter 8. Isaiah writes, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. In other words, don't share God's word right now to these people. Isaiah says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And I will even look eagerly for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. When they say to you, when the people of Judah, when the Ahaz, when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished, and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged. They'll curse their king and their God as they face upward. Then they will look to the earth, and behold, distress, darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. Who are the ones who walk in darkness? They're the ones who reject the Lord as their God. They reject the Lord. It says in verse 19, they would rather consult mediums and spiritists. They would rather consult the occult than to consult to God. In verse 20, it says, they do not seek guidance from the word of God. When it comes to the law and the testimony, they don't seek guidance from God's word. And so it says they have no dawn. Meaning, there's no light. It's a metaphor. They're in darkness. Cheryl and I drove home from Florida nonstop. Well, we did stop for the bathroom and getting something to eat and filling up with gas. But we went straight from Florida, my parents' house, 20 hours to get home. We go through the night. There's less traffic, less trucks. Danger of a car hitting me, zero. Danger of me driving off the edge of the road, high. <laughs> and the darkest part of the night 
is before the dawn. It seems like 5 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the morning is the toughest period to drive. It seems so dark. And you're driving and saying, when is there going to be light? When is there going to be light? When is there going to be light? I think I see a little bit of light. Darkness. And here's a nation, Ahaz and his kingdom, and they will consult to anybody but to God. Isaiah comes along and says, focus on God. He will rescue you. He would rather go to the occult than to focus on God. He would rather look for guidance anywhere but the word of God. Don't get too harsh on these guys who walk in darkness. Is there not our country walking in darkness? Is God relevant to our culture? Or is he irrelevant to our culture? He seems to be irrelevant. What about the word of God? Is this relevant in our culture? Do we obey? Do we follow God's word? No, it's irrelevant in our culture. In a real sense, we are like them. We have no dawn. We're in darkness. And in verses 21 and 22 of chapter 8, they're going to suffer the consequences of their rebellion, of their rejection. Look at the words, hard-pressed, famished. They're going to be enraged and curse their king. And of course, you've got to curse God. It's all his fault. In 22, distress and darkness, gloom of anguish, driven into darkness. Who are the ones who walk in darkness? It's those who reject the Lord, who reject his word, who would rather consult anybody else than go to the Lord for their help. And then you get to chapter 9, verse 1. And what you don't know in Hebrew, actually verse 1 is verse 23 of the previous chapter. It really goes with the other chapter. Because even though there's darkness, gloom of anguish, and they're driven into darkness, there is going to be hope. God, in his grace, is going to make a change. There will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In her early times, Zebulon and the land of Naphtali were treated with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. There's hope. And you get to verse 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. This occurred at the first advent of Jesus coming into the world. Verse 6 kind of hinted at it, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. But Jesus is the great light. In Matthew's gospel, in chapter 4, when it talks about Jesus' ministry after the temptation period, it says in verse 12 of chapter 4, Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken, that's John the Baptist, had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people were sitting in darkness, saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Who's the prophecy referring to? Jesus. And verse 17 says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, change your ways, change your mind about who I am, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is the great light. Hope was given to people who walk in darkness. And over 2,000 years ago, God was ready to do a brand new thing. Hope was given with the births of two miracle baby boys. Leave Isaiah for a moment and go to Luke chapter 1. Luke is the third gospel. If 
If you're using the Bible we provide, it's on page 43. We know this story about how John came, John the Baptist came about, but let me read it real quick for you. In Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were, bo- they were both righteous in the sight of God walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he, Zacharias, was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, He was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Now, this doesn't happen every day. I added that part. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. When do you think they made that petition to God? When do you think they started praying as a couple to have a child? Maybe 50 years earlier? She's barren, now they're both advanced in years, and this angel comes along and says, your petition has been heard. That would have been a shock, right? I wonder what advanced in age means. Is it my age? Is it older than my age? Bottom line is, they're way past childbearing, the years for childbearing, and the Lord says to Gabriel to Zacharias, your petition has been heard. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, kind of like a Nazarite. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Hope was given with the birth of this son, this boy, by the name of John, the son of Zacharias and the son of Elizabeth. And this angel Gabriel, which we're told his name later in the text, the angel Gabriel told Zacharias four important facts about John in verse 17. First, John will go before him. Who's the him? Well, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. Now, the New American Standard adds a forerunner there, meaning he's going to go before as a forerunner of the king. If you jump down to verse 76, if you remember the story, Zacharias didn't believe Gabriel, and so he was made mute, unable to talk, until he wrote on a tablet, his name will be John, and then he could speak. And he gives this prophecy beginning in verse 67, but I want to go down to verse 76 where he's talking about his own son. He says, and you, child will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. You are going to go before the Messiah, before the Lord. And not only that, Gabriel told Zacharias, John, you'll go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. You'll be going in the spirit and power of Elijah. In Malachi chapter 4, 
verse 5, the second to the last verse of the Old Testament. Malachi 4, 5 says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day or awesome day of the Lord. A fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy that John... You're going to have the power of Elijah, the spirit of Elijah, as you go before the Messiah. And in the middle of verse 17, he gives him his ministry. You're going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient, those in disobedience to the attitude of the righteous, wanting to be righteous. John's ministry was calling people to repentance. And Malachi 4, 6, the very last verse of the Old Testament, it says about the forerunner, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. That's your ministry, John, calling people to repentance. And fourth, in verse 17, John's ministry was to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Your job is to get people ready to receive the Messiah. And that takes place, that's fulfilled in a couple chapters over in chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. In the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, Jordan River, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough road smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. That's directly taken from Isaiah 40 verses 3 through 5. John's ministry was to make a people ready to receive the Messiah. And if you go back to Luke chapter 1 and you look at the rest of Zechariah's prophecy regarding John, it says in 76 again, you child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways to give his people the knowledge of salvation. He's going to be pointing to Jesus, the one who gives salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. And because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us. Who is the one from on high who's going to visit? Call the sunrise. Actually, it's the dawn is going to rise on us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Isn't that Isaiah 9? Pointing to Jesus, the one who's going to guide our feet into the ways of peace. John is the first miracle boy. Who do you think the second one is? Yeah, Jesus. It is Christmas after all. So skip down in Luke chapter 1 to verse 26. We know this story. I'm just going to read it. In the sixth month, meaning Elizabeth has been six months pregnant with John. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, the one who visited Zacharias, he was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement, kept pondering what kind of greeting or salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. I love this verse. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord may be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The second miraculous birth is that of Jesus, the Son of Mary and the Son of God. Isaiah 9 says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And Jesus is the great light of Isaiah's prophecy. Not John the Baptist. The Gospel of John, the writer John writes in John 1 verse 6, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. Not through John, but through the light. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Who's the true light? Jesus. And Jesus himself revealed that he was the light of the world. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light. He came to a people who were in darkness. He says, follow me, and you'll have the light of life. Later in John 12, verse 46, Jesus says, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus came as the light. Are you a follower of Jesus? Do you have the light of life? Or are you one who still walks in darkness? It's never too late to put your trust and faith in Jesus, even though you've been in darkness. Hope has come, for God did a new thing by sending his son into the world to save us. And this Advent season, make time to reflect on the coming of Jesus. He came to bring people in darkness hope. Do you think people recognize that they're in darkness? No. Back in Isaiah's day, the people who walk in darkness, they don't recognize they're in darkness, but they are. See, our salvation experience through Christ is so great that it's used in the New Testament in a couple places really strongly about moving from darkness to light. I want to close with two additional passages. Paul wrote the first one in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 4 through 14. Actually, the last word of verse 11 is this word, joyously, and it really goes with this verse. Joyously give thanks to the Father. Why? Because the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Because of our salvation in Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, This Advent season, make it a priority to joyously give thanks to the Father. Do you realize he rescued us from darkness? Do you realize he transferred us into the kingdom of his own son, Jesus? Giving us redemption. That means being freed from sin and giving us forgiveness of sins. And the last passage I want to look at is Paul's testimony that he gave before King Agrippa, Festus, and others that were there. 
This is in Acts chapter 26, and he's talking about the ministry that Jesus gave to him. In verse 18, Jesus' ministry to Paul was to open their eyes, meaning open people's eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and that they could receive an inheritance among those who have been sanctified or those who have already been made holy by faith in me, Jesus says. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you've been made holy by God. You receive the forgiveness of sins, but you have to place your faith in Jesus first. Look at the benefits of that. You turn from darkness to light. You're out of the dominion of Satan. You're now in the dominion of God. My goal for you and for me is that this ministry season of Advent, that we would have that same ministry that Jesus gave Paul, that we would open people's eyes. That we would share the gospel with others, letting them know why Jesus came into this world. He came to give us hope, to save us from our sins. Wouldn't that be a great prayer? Oh, that may we see people turning from darkness to light. Oh, that we would see people turning, being rescued from the domain of Satan and placed in the domain of God. Oh, that we may see people receiving the forgiveness of sins. And that they would receive an inheritance among us who have already put our faith in Jesus. So will you invite people? Will you be persuasive in your invitation to people? To join us during this Advent series. Every Sunday between now and Christmas, I will be presenting the good news of Jesus Christ called the gospel. Today at 3 o'clock, the children are going to put on a musical called The King and Me. It takes place in this world called Royal World. They're going to set up a theme park in Bethlehem. After all, during the census, everyone comes to Bethlehem to register, so why not have a theme park and make money? Now, who doesn't want to see that? Invite people to come. The gospel will be presented. Why Jesus came into this world. Christmas Eve service, the gospel will be presented. Christmas Day service, the gospel will be presented. How can you talk about the birth of Jesus, the birth of the Messiah, without telling why he had to be born? He had to be born in order to die. He had to die in order for you to have a new birth and be part of God's kingdom. Have you been transferred from darkness to light? The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Have you seen Jesus Christ clearly as the light of the world? There's hope for all who currently walk in darkness. You might have family members who are still walking in darkness. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, our Lord. Share Jesus. Be a light yourself. Lord, we come before you thanking you for what we've been learning from Isaiah, from Malachi, from Luke's gospel, Matthew's gospel, John's gospel. We live in a world of darkness. After all, Satan is in, he's the prince of the power of the air. This is his realm. But Lord God, you had your son enter into this darkness to be the light so that we could receive the light, that we would receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, and that we would leave the domain of darkness for the kingdom of Christ Jesus. 
Lord, this Advent season, may we give thanks for the fact that you rescued us out of darkness. May we give thanks for bringing us into the light, forgiving us of our sins, giving us redemption, freedom. And Lord, may each one of us be like Paul. May we ask people to come, not only to church, and not only to different events, but to come and receive Christ Jesus. He changes lives. I know because he changed mine. May this Advent season, when we celebrate the coming of Jesus, may this be a great season because people that we've been praying for to receive Jesus Christ will receive him this year. And we'll give all the glory to you because, Jesus, you are the one who saves. We pray this in your name.